ിയോ <laughs> so there are a lot of uh, hospitals where they where they, where they don't have access to the clinical microbiologist or the, the id people we all know that the id people will act as a the conduit between the clinicians as well as the uh, the microbiologist so in settings where you know don't have an access to id persons or say a clinical microbiologist so it is very important that the clinicians should know uh, what to suspect what to send how to send and how to interpret the, the results from the, the microbiology lab and that is why you know we we thought about uh, having a discussion on uh, a microbiologist wish list for uh, clinicians to take us through the topic you know we are lucky enough to have one of the best clinical microbiologists in the, the country is dr anil kumar uh, he is actually the the professor and head of uh, microbiology at amrita institute of medical sciences uh, kochi kerala he is also uh, the fellow of the european confederation of clinical mycology as well as the the fellow of infectious disease society of america is an excellent clinical micro- microbiologist a great researcher he has around 770 publications more than 100 international publications with an h, h index of uh, say 30 and he is a great uh, uh, orator as well so with this introduction i would like to invite anil kumar sir to take us through the topic first and some housekeeping announcements uh, when sir is speaking i would request all of you to be on mute mode uh any queries you can put on the chat box and we will uh, take it up with sir at the end of the session over to you sir good evening everyone at the outset i would like to thank six especially dr arvind for giving me this opportunity to contribute be part of the sets master class hope i am audible just like sir see Sir, you're audible, sir. No. The slides are perfect. Okay, so this is a wish list of a microbiologist. Every microbiologist has a wish list for the clinicians. It's nothing new. It's uh, it's a request, I would say, more appropriately for clinicians to contribute to the pre-analytic aspect of the diagnostic essay. So more or less, it uh, translates to diagnostic stewardship only pre-analytic part because it's the uh, from what we expect from the clinicians so i'll take you through some of the most important ones that i felt throughout my clinical practice for the last 15 years would be more appropriate to discuss so we'll have three cases just a brief introduction this is a 16 year old female presenting with a swelling on the neck for past one week history of occasional fever associated with the swelling and they send an aspirate pus we culture we get a non fermenter which was identified by the vitex system as burkhodelia cepacea with a very good identification and we released the report we released the report to the doctor and this is the second case where this is a case that was referred to our hospital as an mdrtb he's been taking anti antitubercular treatment for last 12 months and he comes with a non resolving left upper lip consolidation a chest wall abscess and these are the two sinuses discharging pus for the last 6 months so he is on att he is not responding and is suspected to be having an mdr tb sent to our hospital it's a third case case of 43 year old diabetic male on insulin therapy who presented with a nasal blockage so he was referred to us for amphotericin b treatment because they had already given a diagnosis of mucormycosis and our clinician did a biopsy again and we saw this uh, aseptate hyphae with right angle branching so we'll discuss at the end what happened to these three cases and how uh, pre analytic uh, details would have made a difference the first and foremost request to all clinicians would be to provide some clinical details signs symptoms site of the sampling type of the sample underlying diseases is very important if you tell me he's a diabetic the whole picture changes if you tell me he's a transplant patient we it becomes a very a tricky thing what to report and how to report and provisional diagnosis what you are suspecting just don't send a sample tell us what you are, what do you have in your mind so that we we can be guided in interpreting the or processing the sample appropriately 
So let's begin with blood cultures. The most common thing, the most underutilized thing in microbiological practices. The first question is how many blood cultures to be sent? The guidelines say that three sets of blood cultures to be sent. That is, each set has got two bottles. It could be two aerobic or aerobic anaerobic. So it uh, comes to around 60 ml of blood, 5,000 rupees in our hospital. So that's a big deal. Nobody sends the three sets of blood culture anywhere. Only a cardiologist or a medicine person would, medicine physician would send it when he suspects infective endocarditis. Otherwise, we don't see a classical three sets of blood cultures being sent. So if you send one set of blood cultures, the sensitivity is 73%, two sets of blood culture, that is 3,000 rupees, is 89%. And if you add two more blood culture bottles, it is 98%. So technically speaking, there is only a difference of 8 to 9% between two sets of blood cultures and three sets of blood cultures. So in an acute case, two sets of blood cultures is good enough to give you an excellent sensitivity because the patient is really sick. But even that doesn't happen most of the times. So at least send two bottles of blood culture from at least two different sets. Don't send two bottles from the same set. That is, draw the blood from one side and put in the two bottles. At least two <laughs> bottles from two different sides will make a big difference for us to interpret how it is, how, how, how it is coming positive. So how much to be sent? So each adult bottle should have at least 10 ml of blood because each ml of blood is 3% sensitivity. If you reduce the amount of blood, sensitivity goes down. You're spending a lot of money, so try to put at least 10 ml of blood in each adult bottle, 2.5 to 10 ml in pediatric bottles, and 0.5 to 1 ml in infants. Infants, we have a pediatric blood culture bottle, which is separate, and it's only aerobic blood culture bottles. Now, in case you are not able to draw 10 ml, you're drawing only 7 ml of blood, Put everything in the aerobic bottle. Don't bother to inoculate the anaerobic bottle. And if you're having both aerobic and anaerobic bottle to be inoculated, inoculate the aerobic first and then the anaerobic bottle later. So that's how you should be sending blood culture. The, uh, the minimum volume, we used to 10 ml in adults and 2.5 to 10 ml. The volume makes a big difference in the yield. 3% per ml is the percentage. Now, once a blood culture is sent, it flags positive and if it's a critical uh, critical alert. So we immediately, our lab calls, it's a 24-7 lab, the lab calls to the clinician and saying a GPC has grown. Now, positive blood culture is gold standard, sinicodon for uh, bacteremia. It's a gold standard for bacteremia. But if your patient is doing fine, please wait. The reason being, 44% of the times, the GPC that we grow is a contaminant, it's a coagulase negative star. And if it's a coagulase negative staff, 82% of the time, it is a contaminant. It need not be treated. Similarly, other contaminants are cornibacterium, bacillus, species, propionobacterium, viridin streptococci, so on and so forth. So these are the contaminants you should be aware of that they do not be treated in your patients. And you should wait if the patient is doing fine for the final identification to come up. Now, recognized pathogens are any gram negative, any gram positive, candida, anything that grows in the blood, even in a single bottle is a uh, recognized pathogen other than these contaminants. So when does a contaminant become a significant pathogen? A contaminant becomes a significant pathogen if it grows from two bottles drawn on two separate occasions, drawn within two days of each other, two, two, two. Two bottles drawn on two separate occasions within two days of each other. It is drawn within two days of each other. Two separate occasions means two separate act of preparation of site, site preparation and drawing of blood. So if you draw 20 ml and put 10, 10 ml in two bottles, it doesn't mean two different occasions. It means only single occasion. So you have to draw from two different sites with two different acts of preparation of the site. And then if one bottle in each draw is becoming positive for a contaminant, it is considered to be significant and needs treatment. So what is the reason why we say send at least two blood culture bottles? The reason we say is if one blood culture bottle comes positive for a coagulase negative staph or a diphtheroid, you don't know whether it's bacteremia, whether it's a contaminant or an endocarditis. The moment the second bottle comes positive, 50% of the times you are rule out, you are able to rule out the contamination. The, so, well, it rule out the contamination and you know it is a bacteria. The moment a third bottle comes positive, you know it's an infective endocarditis, unless and until two other ones. So that is the reason we send the send at least two sets of blood culture or at least send two bottles of blood culture so that we are able to differentiate whether a contaminant is significant or it's just an innocent bystander. To follow up blood cultures, many people ask, when, when do we do a follow up blood culture? Not routinely recommended. If your patient is doing fine on the treatment, don't do a follow up blood culture. 
but follow up blood culture needs to be done if the patient is not doing uh, fine on your treatment especially when you're treating organisms like uh, having inducible amps like enterobacter cloacae cytobacter clepsidae aerogens yersinia enterocolitis with a cephalosporin third generation cephalosporin they are known to become resistant on treatment so you may need a a repeat blood culture to know whether treatment has failed or not. Or pseudomonas being treated. Pseudomonas is notorious to become resistant on treatment. Then if you have staph aureus bacteremia and candidemia, it's mandatory to send a blood culture, repeat blood culture to know whether microbiological cure has been achieved or not. Because these organisms are very notorious. They can invade normal health, healthy valves and create endocarditis. So normal valves can be colonized and cause endocarditis. And moreover, the main aim of treating staph aureus bacteremia and candidemia is to prevent metastatic infection. So we need to know, have an evidence of a microbiological cure. So send a repeat blood culture when you have staph aureus and candidemia in your patients. Otherwise, no need for sending a blood culture if the patient is doing fine on your treatment. And if follow-up blood culture comes positive, it either means infective endocarditis or it means in an appropriate treatment, you have to change the treatment. So which bottles to be sent, aerobic or anaerobic? So in a hospitalized patient, always send an aerobic blood culture bottle, aerobic pair, no need to send anaerobic blood cultures because anaerobic bacteremia is rare. Most of your antibiotics will cover anaerobes. Bacteremia mostly is caused by aerobic and facultative anaerobic organisms. And in your hospitalized patients, you don't want to miss acinetobacter, pseudomonas, barcodelia, chrysobacterium, which are strict aerobes. So if you send an anaerobic bottle, anaerobic bottle means 10 ml of blood, 3% is the sensitivity of each ml. So you lose 30% of the sensitivity by just sending an anaerobic bottle of not detecting acinetobacter, non-fermenters like acinetobacter and pseudomonas. So all hospitalized patients try to send aerobic bottles. And if you have a community-acquired infection like infective endocarditis from the community, send an aerobic anaerobic bottle because the yield of HACIC organisms or nutritionally deficient streptococci is good in anaerobic bottles. Now, how do you diagnose fungemia? The only way to diagnose fungemia with us is by a culture. Culture flags positive for candida and we come to know it's candida because we don't have access to markers like 13 beta d glucan. Even I don't have access to 13 beta d glucan. So if, which bottle to be sent for fungemia? So this particular study showed that if you inoculated 12 candida albicans in aerobic bottles, 11 grew and none of them grew in anaerobic bottles. Tropicalis, 12 were inoculated, all the 12 grew in aerob aerobic bottles. And other Canada species, 17 were inoculated, 16 grew in aerobic bottles, and only two grew in anaerobic bottles. So Canada is a strict arrow. It grows in aerobic bottles only. It won't grow in anaerobic bottles. So another reason for sending aerobic blood cultures in your hospitalized patient is to pick up candidemia. You don't want to miss candidemia. Send aerobic bottles. Let's discuss urine cultures. So diagnostic criteria of urine culture, you all know about it. It depends on the site. Site has to be mentioned from where you are taking the urine. If it's a suprapubic aspirate, any colony, any number of colonies is significant. We have to report it and it is significant. But you have a urinary catheter in C2, more than 10 to the power 4 is considered to be significant. If you have a midstream urine, midstream, uh, uh, classical midstream urine collection, then you have 10 to the power 5 as the cutoff. But if you specify that the patient is symptomatic, has symptoms, acute urinary symptoms, has got pyuria, 10,000 to 50,000 colonies are also significant, needs to be reported, patient needs to be treated. So just by telling us where the sample was taken, we will be able to add the symptoms that the patient is having, we'll be able to determine whether the number of colonies being grown in that particular sample are significant or not. And you can also determine whether it's a significant pathogen or not. So we all know about the urinary symptoms. I won't go into it. But COTI, that is catheter-associated UTI, you have to have fever and suprapubic pain. Otherwise, don't send urine because just because it is foul-smelling, just because it's cloudy, just because the patient's mental status has suddenly changed, or there is pyuria, presence of catheter itself will cause irritation and pyuria is a normal thing in catheterized patients. If the patient doesn't have symptoms, don't send samples just because of these few reasons. This is not UTI. If symptoms are there, only then send a urine. Asymptomatic bacteria, there are two conditions, two situations where asymptomatic bacteria occur. One is the presence of catheter. You have an in-situ catheter, it could be urethral catheter, it could be suprapubic catheter, and you grow a uropathogen, at least one type of uropathogen in significant numbers, and the patient doesn't have any symptoms. So that is asymptomatic uh, candiduria or bacteriuria in a catheterized patient. You don't need to treat these patients. 
the only uh, conditions where you need to treat them is during urological manipulations. If you're planning some urological manipulations, asymptomatic bacteria needs to be treated. If the patient is neutropenic or low birth weight, you may consider treating asymptomatic bacteria in a catheterized patients. Asymptomatic bacteria without a catheter, we all know pregnancy is a condition where you need to report it, you need to treat it. And another condition is you have urological manipulation. You are planning some urological manipulation. You send a culture before doing the procedure. It comes positive. You need to eradicate that pathogen in the urine so that you can go ahead with the urological manipulation that you are planning. And whenever you plan to send a urine sample in a catheterized patient, always make sure that you put a new catheter and send the urine. It will relieve the symptoms of the patient as well as give us a very good sample for culture because catheters get colonized at the rate of 5% per day. That is 10, 10 days, 50% of them are colonized. So most of the catheters are colonized by 10 days, 15 days, 5% per day. So you will get a culture positive, but whether it's significant or not, we have to decide whether the patient is having symptoms like the propylic pain or new onset of fever. Then staph aureus. If staph aureus is grown in urine, then it's a red flag. Staph aureus is not a normal uropathogen. It's not no, you usually seen. It's seen only if you have risk factors like a in situ catheter or I have a urological manipulation. If you don't have these risk factors, you are going staph aureus in urine, it means that there is infection at some other site, like an endovascular infection, a joint infection, a bone infection. So always send a blood culture when you get staph aureus in urine without any risk factors like urological manipulation or in situ catheter, because there could be an occult bacteremia that you're missing. And you don't want to miss a staph aureus uh, infection in the blood because it needs to be treated appropriately because it may lead to metastatic infections and infective endocarditis if not treated appropriately. So it's not a urine infection, it is infection somewhere else which is getting passed into the urine. Respiratory samples. Now again, respiratory samples, we do a semi-quantitative culture, we need to know where you are sending the sample from. So it could be a sputum which requires 10 to the power 5 colony, unit, colony forming units, it could be an endotracheal aspiration, 10 to the power 5 colony forming unit is significant. It could be a BAL, 10 to the power 4 is significant. And if you have sending a protective specimen brush, 10 to the power 3 colonies are significant. So by knowing the site the type of specimen that you are sending, we are able to determine whether the colony forming units grown are significant or not. The integrity of the sample is reflected here. So this is a study where they did an intervention in community acquired pneumonia, which were admitted in the hospitals. So usually the sample is nasopharyngeal sample or pharyngeal samples that are being sent to the culture. So you see this blue, big blue chunk, this means the negative cultures. These are the negative cultures when you send the nasopharyngeal swab and these are the negatives when you send the pharyngeal secretions. So a lot of samples become negative because the sample integrity is not that great. The intervention was that you ask the patients to expectorate the sample or you do an induced sputum. Only expectorated samples or induced sputum was sent for culture. After intervention, it was found the negativity reduced significantly. The number of samples also reduced significantly. And the yield increased double, 51%. If you had sent nasopharyngeal swab, you had to send a lot of samples and the yield was only 24%. Just by doing a small intervention, you made sure that you get good sputum sample, that is expectorated sample or induced sample, your yield is twice increase the yield twice and you have very less negative culture. So you, you're not wasting resources by sending sputum samples by giving an appropriate sample. The sputum cultures should be sent only if you suspect pneumonia, lower respiratory tract infection. You don't send it for a uh, proven case of viral infection. It will confuse you and cultures will grow something. Respiratory specimens are not sterile. It will grow something. It doesn't mean the infection is there clinically correlated with the Report that we provide from microbiological side and then go ahead and treat the pathogen. Pus and tissue culture. Now, we've known surgeons who have drained liters of pus and then take a swab, small swab, some, some form and send it for culture. That's a very bad method of sending for pus cultures. I would request all clinicians to send aspirate fluid tissues. Aspirate with the needle and syringe. Even if it is 0.5 ml, give me an aspirate. Take the insulin syringe and aspirate and send it me. Don't send a swab. It's the least preferred sample. Not that I would reject a swab, but it's the least preferred sample. If you can't get anything, send a swab, but don't send one swab. Send multiple swabs so that it is wet and it has uh, completely covered with the pus and it comes to us as soon as possible so that it doesn't get dry. So don't send a swab. 
send the fluid, send the tissue because swabs can become dried and the yield is very poor. So they call, they come, compare tissue cultures with a swab with transport media, tissue cultures yield was 93%. And swab with transport media is 70%. Nobody uses swab with it. I don't know whether you use it. We don't use it. Most of the hospitals don't use swab with transport media. But if you use transport media, acceptable yield is there. Swabs will never grow your non tuberculous mycobacteria that may be present in your chronic discharging sinuses or a filamentous fungi. Canada may grow, but filamentous fungi may, be, may not grow. And provide relevant details. You are giving me a pus aspirated from a deep space. If it's a... So was abscess, I know what to look for. If it's a brain abscess, I know what you look for. It's totally different more, uh, type of organisms are seen it. So just let me know the uh, history of the patient, the underlying condition of the patient. If you tell me the patient is diabetic, the diagnosis changes. We, we are looking for something else, not the usual pattern. So when you are aspirating from a deep-seated abscess or doing a CT-guided biopsy, Send samples for pus culture, send samples for fungal culture, send samples for TB culture if indicated. If you think it is could be TB, always send for TB. All the three should be sent because doing a CT guided biopsy, you won't get another sample. Doing a brain ap uh, abscess aspiration, you won't, serotaxic abscess, you won't get another opportunity to do it. So send all the three. We have seen instances after CT guided and renal biopsy for malignancy, we found fungal infection in histopathology. Then we had to do it again to know that it was a blastomycosis seen then. So always send for culture for fungus as well as protein bacterial as well as rule out TB if indicated. So go beyond mycobacteria, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Whenever you see an AFP, don't think it is mycobacterium tuberculosis, especially when your smear AFP is positive and your CB natus comes negative, it means it is a non tuberculous mycobacteria. Look for non tuberculous mycobacteria, you will get lots in your patients. Chronic post-operative infections, especially laparoscopic in, uh, surgeries, it is invariably non tuberculous mycobacteria. Look for it. Injection abscess, especially insulin syringe injection. They don't change the needle, just they wipe the needle and they use multiple times. So we have seen cases of injection abscess on the abdomen due to non tuberculous mycobacteria. Abscesses with sinus tract, look for non tuberculous mycobacteria. Chronic UTI, not responding to all conventional treatment, not growing anything. Having pyuria may be a mycobacteria, which could be non tuberculous mycobacteria, not TB. And pulmonary TB, not responding to ATT, is not always TB. It could be non tuberculous mycobacteria. We have seen many instances. So the dictum is when you send for tuberculosis, send for CBNAT, send for smear, send for culture. It will pick up all your non tuberculous mycobacteria also if it is present except mycobacterium merinium, which doesn't grow at 37 degrees centigrade. So if you have a clinical suspicion of mycobacterium merinium, the history, the risk factors, always inform the lab that you are suspecting mycobacterium merinium. They will incubate it at room temperatures so that they can get. We have seen a case where they didn't mention it and we didn't grow it. And later on, it was a classical case of mycobacterium merinium. We were not able to culture it, but smear was positive and the patient responded with treatment. Fungal smears and culture, when you are thinking of fungal infection, again, don't send swamps. Send a tissue, send an aspirate, even 0.5 ml of aspirate is great. If you don't have anything, ten, send an impression smear of that area so that we can do a gram stain, not a KOH. KOH cannot be done unless and until you provide a tissue, tissue specimen or a liquid specimen. But if you can provide an impression smear, we can do a gram stain. Even gram stain will yield fungus, show fungus. If it's a filamentous fungus, if the yeast you can easily see in a gram stain, don't think that gram stain will not show. Just write query fungal infection in the request form so that we look for fungus in the gram stain. And provide clinical details like mucormycosis. If you're suspecting mucormycosis, it's a very difficult way to uh, get those uh, samples because many times my ENT surgeon has said, Anil, I can't give you tissue. If I put a force up there, it will bleed like anything I can't do. I can send you a swab. Okay, you talk to the microbiologist. I say you send the swab. I don't know. Uh, I will process it, but yield would be less. But I'll try, still try to process it. Not send me multiple swabs. And I tell the lab, accept it, process it in a very careful manner, make sure that all the edges of the swabs are swabbed, they taken care of, and we can get cultures positive. And mucormycosis, another thing is that if you don't mention it, if we crush the tissue, grind it as we usually do and inoculate it, the mucormycosis will never grow. The mucormycosis will not grow because they are very fragile uh, fungus. So that we have to take care of. Well, the moment you tell us mucormycosis, we handle the specimen with great care so that the 
pathogen is number. Yield is historically very low because of this reason. And Canada growing in any of the respiratory and urine cultures is always a commensal. It's a colonizer. Don't go ahead and treat it. If you want to treat oropharyngeal candidiasis, yes, go ahead and see. Check the patient whether he's got oropharyngeal candidiasis. Otherwise, don't think it is a pneumonia. It's a UTI. If it's a catheter patient, change the catheter. That's all you have to do. With. And for chronic meningitis, rule out tuberculosis first. Once we have ruled out tuberculosis, go ahead and do a cryptococcal antigen test. An excellent test to determine cryptococcal meningitis. Don't ever think that cryptococcal meningitis is seen only in immunocompromised patients. Immunocompetent patients also have it. We have seen patients being treated for tuberculosis for years. Come here and get diagnosed from a CSF of an EVD that it's cryptococcal meningitis. So we were wondering whether he got cryptococcal meningitis after getting an EVD or before then. So the, the, actually it was a pre-existing cryptococcal meningitis that was considered to be TB and treated as TB. The patient died ultimately by the time he came to a diagnosis. So rule out cryptococcal meningitis using a cryptococcal antigen in all case of chronic meningitis where you have ruled out tuberculosis. C. difficile. Now C. difficile is a test that you do for patients in hospital who have diarrhea. So 20% of the hospitalized patients are colonized with C. difficile. Those just don't send a C. difficile just because the patient said that I had a diarrheal episode. Or oh, active infection is seen only one to two percent. If you send samples, sample samples randomly, then you will get a lot of positives because these colonizers will be picked up and you end up treating the wrong patient. You may have other problems because of the treatment of uh, C. difficile. So when to send C. difficile samples? You send C. difficile samples, see samples for C. difficile only if the patient is hospitalized for more than 72 hours, has the risk factors, classical risk factors like broad spectrum antibiotics for C. difficile diarrhea. Only then send a sample. Now, what, how do you define a diarrhea? Don't go by the patient's words that he has got diarrhea. It should be more than three watery stools in 24 hours. Time. If it is two watery stools, no chance. So three watery stools in 24 hours time is called a diarrhea. You have to rule out alternate reasons for diarrhea. It could be a paroral contracts. It could be a laxative within 24 hours. If that is there, don't send it. And you haven't sent a C. difficile for last seven days. If you have sent a C. difficile for the last seven days, don't send the C. difficile again. There is no test for cure of C. difficile. You can't cure C. difficile by doing a PCR and making it negative. So that will not happen. So if all these criteria are fulfilled, then only send a sample for C. difficile. And what about the stool? The stool should be Bristol stool chart type 7. That is fully watery. Fully watery, no pieces of solid in the stool. Only then send the sample for C. difficile. The yield would be good. If it can come positive more often, it comes positive, you can go ahead and treat it. It's a classical case of C. difficile diet. Now, antibiotic accessibility testing and reporting. Now, microbiologists are well cultured people. They grow, you send something, they'll grow many things. Okay, don't bother. We'll grow many things and you'll get a diagnosis. Don't believe it's a diagnosis. So, don't expect us to report everything. Don't expect us to report right, left, and center every antibiotic that we have in the panel. So we have certain criteria for reporting. We don't report these things in urine. Don't expect chlorampanic, alkandamycin, erythromycin, digicycline. Moxifloxacin is the only fluoroquinolone that doesn't excrete in the urine. So don't by default think all fluoroquinolones will work. Moxifloxacin is not indicated. Minocycline also doesn't go to the urine. The only things that we report in exclusively in the urine is phosphomycin and nitroferantoid. In respiratory tract, we won't report daptomycin. Don't ask for a daptomycin sensitivity. And if it's a CSF uh, sample, we won't report any uh, drug that can be given only orally. There is no IV formulation. And first, yet second generation cephalosporins are not reported. Cephamycin, clindamycin, macrolides, fluoroquinolones, doripenem, mertapenem, and apenem. Only meropenem has got a adequate present, uh, penetration, so we report only meropenem. So these are the drugs we won't report by default. And just because two things are gram positive, it doesn't mean that you can use any antibiotic. Enterococcus, staphylococcus, gram positive, it doesn't mean you can use interchange the drugs. Enterococcus, work, penicillin works wonders. Ampicillin, amoxicillin, it's sensitive, they can use, you can use alone. But it's not the case in staphylococcus, you can't find any sap which is sensitive to penicillin or ampicillin. Then, enterococcus is inherently resistant to cephalosporins, inherently resistant to cotrimoxol, inherently resistant to clindamycin, which are very good options for staphylococcus. So don't think that staphylococcus and trococcus are the same, so you can use the same panel of antibiotics in both the cases. Now, a few other examples are staphylococcus species. Don't think of septazidine. It is not useful in staphylococcus species. 
staph saprophyticus is a very common case, uh, common cause of cystitis in females. But phosphomycin will not work. Phosphomycin by default everybody gives for cystitis, but if it's a saprophyticus, won't work. Enterococcus, I've already told you, inherently resins of cotrimoxol, and it is the ciprosporid, sclindamycin, and certain bugs like enterococcus, gallerinum, calciliflavus, lactobacillus, leuconostoc, very weird names. If you find weird names, they are not, they are your highest antibiotic will not work on it. Just uh, leave out the highest antibiotics. Listeria, very good example where ciprosporins will not work. So by default, for every meningitis, don't give ciprosporins. You don't give, I know, you add ampicillin to it. All gram positives, no coverage in astronam, polymexin, and cholestin. So when you're using astronam, or polymyxin or cholestin, there is no gram positive coverage at all. A few non fermenters, acinetobacter, ampicillin, amoxiclav, vertapenem, and phosphomycin are ineffective. Barcorilacipase are inherently related to cholestin along with ampicillin, amoxiclav, dicarcillin, aminoglycosides, phosphomycin, and apenem. Stenotropomonas, they are inherently related to carbapenems uh, along with that, dicarcillin, piperacillin, piperacillin, dazobactam, aminoglycosides, and phosphomycin. Pseudomonas inherently resin to am ampicillin, amoxiclav, only ceftazidim works, other third generation ciprosporin doesn't work, etapenem doesn't work, phosphomycin doesn't work, tegicycline doesn't work, cotrimoxol doesn't work, even nitrofurantine doesn't work in urine. So make sure that you don't use this, we won't report it, don't ask for it. Now, word on invasive pneumococcal infections, invasive pneumococcal, especially meningitis is deadly, if you don't treat it uh, appropriately, it's deadly. Now, there are two breakpoints in pneumococcus. One is meningitis and one is non-meningitis. If it is sensitive to oxacillin, yeah, everything is fine. You have reported penicillin sensitive. But if it's oxacillin resistant, then you, what, you, what you do is you have to do an MIC and you have two breakpoints. Less than two is for non-meningitis, less than 0.06 is for meningitis. Similar for ciprotaxin or septraxin, and less than one for non-meningitis, less than 0.5 for meningitis. So the zest of the thing is that when you have a report of pneumococcal infection, then you have to have two big points. You have to report whether it's sensitive to meningitis or resistant to meningitis and sensitive to non-meningitis or resistant to non-meningitis. So it's very, very important to tell us whether the patient is having meningitis or the microbiologist by default should be reporting this way so that if at all there is a case of meningitis, you don't use penicillin or surprise. Now, Indian studies have shown that resistance to penicillin is as high as 27% is meningitis cases. And even cephalosporin has got 10% resistance in meningitis cases. So by default, if you have a pneumococcal meningitis, you go with an empirical treatment with a cephalosporin and vancomycin because the background resistance is as high as 10%. So go with this. Once the sensitivity comes, ceftriaxin is shown sensitive in meningitis, you can de-escalate from vancomycin. The double androbic cover very commonly used. We tend to add a septazolamycin or metronidazole. The idea says that only two indications for double androbic cover: clostridium difficile infection, which is not responding to vancomycin, or necrotizing fasciitis. So you should understand anaerobic infections. Uh, anaerobic treatment uh, drugs are required in cases like uh, aspiration pneumonia, intra-abdominal infections, gynecological infections, diabetic foot infections. Other than this, whatever you're using is good enough because. Here, the comparison with clindamycin and piperacillin does better. The androbic cover is almost identical. Both are equally good in covering androbes, except for the fact that actinomyces is, low, actin actinomyces is not covered by piperacillin does better. So you should understand that most of your beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitors like ampicillin, talbactam, amoxiclav, ticacillin, clavulinic acid, piperacillin, tazobactam, carbapenem, ciprotitan, moxifloxacin, and chloramphenicol. Moxifloxacin is the only fluoroquinolone having androbic cover can be used for androbes. So these have got Good amount of anaerobic cover, you don't need to add a clindamycin or metron result to it. And no anaerobic cover is seen in cephalosporins, chloroquinolones, aminoglycosides, cotrimoxol, cholestin, and phosphomycin. So when you're using these drugs and you have an element of anaerobic infection there, add an anaerobic cover. So which, which combination to use? What to use? Piperacillin dazobactam or ciprocin salbactam? Most of them use it interchangeably. They think the spectrum is almost clear. Same. Both of them can be used in ESBL infections, provided it is not sepsis, it is biliary or UTI, both of them can be used. Enterococcus coverage is seen only in piperacillin, so don't use ciprocin salvac. Pseudomonas coverage, piperacillin is a better anti-pseudomonal when compared to ciprocin salvac. Acinetobacter coverage, ciprocin salvactam is a better antibiotic than piperacillin dazobactam. Anaerobic coverage, go with piperacillin dazobactam rather than ciprocin salvactam. It has, but it's not as good as piperacillin dazobactam. 
So when you have an intra-abdominal infection, go for Piprazine Zalbac. When you have a respiratory infection, not anaerobic, you can go for Ciprazine Zalbac. If it's an anaerobic component, it's there, go for Piprazine Zalbac. If you're thinking of enterococcus, pseudomonas, think of Piprazine Zalbac. Now, after the proper orange. Now, because President Azubakton, the breakpoints have changed in 2022. What was considered sensitive 16 has become susceptible dose dependent, and sensitive it has gone to less than eight. Because PKPD studies have shown that attaining targets is uh, not possible if the MICs is more than eight micrograms in the President Azubakton. That's why they came up with the susceptible dose dependent. So, if you are, if you are. Organism, yes, yeast gill producing organism has got an MIC of less than eight. You can go ahead with a dose of 3.375 grams or 4.5 grams every six hourly, a 30, 30 minute infusion. But if your breakpoint is SDD, that is 16 micrograms, then you have to use only 4.5 grams given six hourly and a three hour infusion or a four hour infusion, eight hourly. So those totally different is different for SDD and S. If it is sensitive, you have a different dose. If you have an STD breakpoint, you have a different dose of piprazine dazobactam. And piprazine dazobactam should be avoided in all cases of sepsis because the Merino trial showed that it is inferior to the carbapenems. Cholesterol is the most controversial antibiotic. We, if you talk about the microbiologists, they will be helpless because neither the E test nor the distribution, neither the auto, auto, automated Vitek or Phoenix system, the susceptibility can be done. They are not reliable. The only method to do is broth microdilation, which is tedious, labor intensive, and you have to run a control for every run. A control organism should be there, which has uh, a definitive uh, MIC, and that should pass. Only then the MICs are valid. Then you can do a cholestin broad disc elution method. That is a cheap method that can be done. And moreover, what's the point in doing when you know that less than two micrograms, I am going to report intermediate, more than four micrograms, I am going to report as resistant. There is no susceptible breakpoint for polystin. Don't expect the microbiologist to report the polystin sensitivity that it is sensitive. And moreover, polystin has got a very poor spectrum. So you have to add another antibiotic to it, another broad spectrum antibiotic to it. And also, it doesn't have any effect in pneumonia, neither IV nor inhaled. So it's not, not a very good option for CREs nowadays. Uh, CLIS 2023 has updated the Amino glycoside breakpoints. Now, amino glycoside breakpoints have been reduced one or two dilutions down in case of enterobacteria. So, we were finding good sensitivity uh, amino glycoside like amikacin. Now, 2023 onwards, the sensitivity is bound to go down because the breakpoints have been reduced. And then for pseudomonas, it has only amikacin has only urinary breakpoints. So, in 2023, if you have implemented the guidelines, I won't be reporting pseudomonas in blood. Uh, amikacin in blood for pseudomonas. I will report it. amikacin only in urine. Gentamicin is, doesn't have interpretation for any of the sites. Tobramycin has got a sensitive breakpoint of less than one. So they are pseudomonas, the amaniglycoside option is not there because they consider that pseudomonas becomes very resistant on treatment and most of them are already resistant to amaniglycosides. So what about MICs? Everybody wants MICs. There is a quantitative value and they want it. Most of the people want MICs. But as long as CLSI is given a disk diffusion breakpoint, a qualitative breakpoint, don't consider MICs to be superior. Most of the cases you can easily manage using the disk diffusion breakpoints. Most of the labs do disk diffusion. Even we do it. Even in developed countries, they do it. It is as good as MICs. But only in exceptional circumstances, you may require MICs. I'll come to it. So this is the MIC. And the MIC is done in tubes or microbot dilution. Now, this isolate has grown in 8 micrograms, didn't grow in 16 micrograms. The MIC is considered to be 16. But actually, this is not the true MIC. It's something, anything between 8 to 16. 8 to 16, we have 8 digits. It could be 9, it could be 10, it could be 11, it could be 11.5, anything would be. But we won't be able to do that much of MIC. So, MIC of 16 means it could be anything between 8 to 16. So, we don't provide you a true value of MIC. And the MIC doesn't represent in vivo concentrations. And again, by just knowing the MIC, it is not that great. What will the clinician do? But if you ask a clinician which is the best drug for this E. coli in urine, they'll say ciprofloxacin is the best drug because it's 0.125. Fosomycin is the worst because it is 2 micrograms. The number, the number matters. 0.125 is far less than 2. But for that, you have to know the breakpoints. Breakpoints is the concentration that can be achieved at that particular site. So what the clinician needs to know is the breakpoint to MIC quotient. That is how many times the MIC you can achieve the concentration at the site. So if you look at the BMQ breakpoint to MIC quotient, the ciprofloxacin has got the least BMQ 
Fosfomycin has got the highest BMP of 30. So the best drug in this situation is the one which has got the highest MIC and the highest BFP because it gets concentrated very well in that side. So lower MIC doesn't mean the drug is good. You have to know the breakpoint. And then there are areas where you need a break, uh, MIC like vancomycin. You have to do an MIC for staph aureus. Enterococcus, if it comes intermediate to vancomycin, you have to do an MIC. Most of the non fermenters require MICs. Most of the cholestin and polymyxin, invariably, you have to do a broth microdilation, get MICs. If streptococcus pneumonia is resistant to oxacillin, you have to do an MIC for penicillin and ceftriaxone. on give breakpoints separate from meningitis and non meningitis. And there are a few comments that are always associated or given along with the uh, microbiology report. Try to read them like rifampicin should not be used alone, gentamicin should not be used alone for staph aureus. You have AMC inducers, like cyclobacter, cerasia. Try to avoid third generation cephalosporins. Pseudomonas will get uh, resistant on treatment. Then you have it's a colonizer, it's a contaminant, clinical correlation warranted, treat only if the patient is symptomatic. Such comments will always be there. Try to read those and make sense of them. Now, treat your patient, not the microbiology report. There's a 60 90 rule. 90% 90 of the patients whom you report it is sensitive will respond. 60% of the patients whom I report, that it is resistant, will still respond to the resistant antibiotic because everybody behaves differently. They concentrate the drug differently at different sites. So immunocompetent patients may get away with the infection. Are the MICs that we determine, I said, I have not given you the true MICs. There are many other MICs that need to be determined. So that will be the reason the patient is responding. You have given a bolus antibiotic. The drug has made its effect. So that must be the reason. There is a poor, poor renal function. The drug is being concentrated very well in the body, then it must be responding. So that, that are the reasons why you get away with infections being treated with the resistant antibiotic. But don't try to treat an MRSA with a amoxiclav or a bipracillin dazobactam just because your patient is doing fine. It is not recommended. MRSA requires anti-MRSA drugs, not beta lactams. So whenever you get a microbiology report, do an interpretive reading. You first look at the specimen and site, see whether it is sterile or non-sterile site. Right, right. You go for the, or the, or the, or the whether it's relevant, contaminant, or a commensal. Then you go to the susceptibility report. You look at the antibiotic indicators, indicators for ESBLs like septraxone, septacidine. If it is resistant, you know it is an ESBL. Look at erythromycin sensitivity in staph aureus. You can see whether glendamycin is sensitive or resistant. The common phenotype, whether it's an ESBL, it's a common phenotype. Unusual phenotype, CRE, or a cholestin resistant, unusual. Impossible phenotype, that you are giving ciftazidine sensitive and carbapenem resistant. That is an impossible phenotype, but can occur in pseudomonas because of various reasons. And then ultimately, you look at the clinical relevance of the inferred resistance. And last but not the least, any comments that we give, try to read it and make sense of it. So order a test judicially. A diagnostic test should be ordered if the pre-test probability is very high. If the pre-test probability of the disease is not high, don't order the test. And give us the history of the patient, underlying condition, what you're looking for. The post-test probability increases with these uh, details. All the laboratory will do is convert your pre-test probability to post-test probability it won't give you a diagnosis. For example, you send a urine from a catheterized patient and we grow E. coli in significant numbers. That doesn't mean the patient is having UTI. UTI is there only if the patient has signs and symptoms of UTI. We just confirm your pretest probability, but if your pretest probability was very poor, then the diagnosis is wrong. So don't order urine cultures, group A strep, C. difficile without any indication, without fulfilling the clinical, clinical criteria. Otherwise, you'll end up with the wrong report. So what happened to our case one? 16 year old female presented with a swelling in the neck. We grew Bartholdia cepacea. Now this was an endocrinologist who called me back and told me, Anil, it's a diabetic patient, type one diabetes since eight years, and you have reported Bartholdia cepacea. Then we realized that it cannot be Bartholdia cepacea. We revisited the isolate. We confirmed that it was pseudomaly. Pseudomaly and cepacea require totally different treatment. Duration of treatment is separate. So we ended up treating appropriately because the clinician was real smart. He called me and asked me whether it's actually Bartholdia cepacea. Now, this gentleman came with uh, non-responding TB, presumptive TB. And then we asked where he come, came from. He was a software engineer. When, we asked, when I actually asked the uh, respiratory physician where he was the software engineer, he said he was from Chicago. So he was working in Chicago. He developed symptoms there and then came here. And for, for 12 months, he's being treated for TB. And he had two uh, sinuses discharging pus. 
So we went there. Actually, I still remember going there at the bedside and uh, collecting the pus because he won't allow us to put another needle because last time they put a needle, it became a science. And we did a gram scene of the pus. We found budding yeast cells, uh, broad-based budding. We grew blastomycosis and we reported it also. And he was totally cured of blastomycosis in one year of treatment of vitroconazole. And then he went back to Chicago for a higher position. Okay, now class three, this is a 43-year diabetic man with the diagnosis of mucormycosis, diabetic, insulin therapy, mass. Uh, it's a, so he came here for amphotericin B treatment. He couldn't afford treatment, um, uh, liposomal amphotericin B and plain amphotericin B, he can't tolerate because he's a diabetic and renal functions were not that great. The biopsy, the histopathologist told me that there is a ring of uh, eosinophilic infiltrate. So he said the splendor hoply phenomena is seen. And when we cultured the biopsy, we got quality bolus coronates. So it's a case of uh, endomophthorates, endomophthormycosis, and the patient did not require like, amphotericin in the first place. We treated the patient with vitraconazole, the uh, lesion resolved very well, healthy, and he went back home happy. So test selection, remember ordering a diagnostic laboratory test is like picking your nose in public. You must first consider what you will do if you find some. So order a test judicially, otherwise we'll give many things and you will end up getting confused or treating the wrong things. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. A great way to uh, end the lecture. Uh, in a very short time, you have actually uh, emphasized the importance of uh, the need for a, having a very proactive discussion between the clinician and the microbiologist so as to optimize the outcome for the patients. Uh, shall I take some questions, sir, uh, from the yeah, chat yeah. box? So one is actually, uh, uh, is, uh, you actually mentioned the indications for double anaerobic coverage. The question is with regard to that, can you again uh, mention in which are situations a double anaerobic coverage may be prudent? Double anaerobic cover according to IDSA is, uh, one is necrotizing fasciitis and second is uh, clostridium difficile diarrhea where vancomycin in the patient is not responding, you can add a metronidazole to it. Otherwise, double anaerobic cover is not recommended. But clinically, if you think a retropharyngeal abscess is not responding to bibrazolin as a tazobactam alone, you can add a double anaerobic cover. Clinical decision is totally different. If you think your primary antibiotic or single antibiotic is not working, you can use it, but not for flimsy reasons. Other uh, For adding metronidazole or clindamycin when you're having meropenem or a digicycline or a piprazin tazobactam is not indicated because they have uh, adequate anaerobic cover. So the next question is actually, uh, how should we collect blood culture in patients with uh, FEMFIGS as the risk of contamination is high? Well, that's a very difficult question. Even I, do, I, I won't be able to answer that. But that's a very tricky situation because the site preparation is a nightmare and you, know, you won't be getting a proper specimen. But you can try and write that this uh, collection was compromised to because of the site of the infection was infected. We'll try uh, to make sense of what is growing, but contamination rate would be high. So we should be ready for facing a contamination. So a gram-positive cocci comes, then a gram-positive bacilli comes, you should uh, wait till the identification comes. Try to send multiple cultures because the chance of contamination of multiple cultures is less when compared to a single blood culture. So send multiple cultures from different sites, then we may be able to make sense out of whether the bacteremia is there or not. Uh, so next one, a patient grows two organisms in an intraoperative tissue culture, a pan-susceptible Klebsiella and uh, MSSA resistant to quinolones. Can we choose to uh, treat both with ceftriaxone or cevipine? A ceftriaxone doesn't have good gram-positive coverage. The higher the generation, the more gram-negative they cover. But cefuroxam, cefazolin is better for staph aureus if it's an MSSA. And if you have a gram negative, according to the susceptibility, you can use it. But you can't use septriaxone for both, I presume. But uh, Dr. Arvind would be in a better place to comment on the aspect. Uh, I think uh, you know, there are certain recent articles regarding the role of septriaxone in MSSA. Probably I may, may not select septriaxone to cover MSSA as of now. So, uh, so the next question is with regard to uh, Corti. Uh, whether we should go for 10 raised to 3 or 10 raised to 4, which amount of colony is significant? See, Corti, Corti is a surveillance definition. And you have to take the sample only when the patient is symptomatic, having cipropipic tenderness, having new onset of fever, because presence of cloudy urine, uh, pyuria, etc. is not indicative of sending a culture. 
So you send a culture only the patient is symptomatic and 10 to the power 4 is considered to be good enough because the unit catheter is there. 5% per day colonization is there. Anyway, you are taking the sample in 4 or 5 days. So colonization would be good enough to give a good number of colonies. If you reduce the colony forming unit numbers, then most of your samples would become cotting. So the HAI rates will go up. So that you should take care that by reducing the threshold, the rates would increase and you end up treating the wrong patient. So Forty is 10 to the power 4, so you should consider 10 to the power 4 as a cutoff and send only when it is indicated. Otherwise, don't send the sample, just change the catheter. So do, and Canada growing from a catheter is not potty. Canada is not included in potty. Uh, so next one is how to differentiate CD colonization uh, versus pathogenic CD. The only way to differentiate is that you send a sample from the right patient. If the patient is not correct, it is colonization. The correct patient is the patient is having diarrhea. The diarrhea is three times in 24 hours. The diarrhea means a stool which is totally watery, no solid material in it. And you don't have other causes for diarrhea. Like you don't have a laxative being given nor or a per oral contrast. So you rule out all these things. You are selecting a very good patient. And then the post-test probability of that test coming positivity is high and the positive makes sense. Otherwise, the positive C. difficile toxin doing a PCR doesn't make sense for all patients who say that I have diarrhea. You have to make a decision whether he has a diarrhea. And the lab will should reject any sample which has got any solid elements in the stool. Don't go ahead with the testing. Um, cancel the order. Let the patient have that money. Uh, so next one is the role of uh, piperacillin tazobactam in salmonella. Salmonella drug of choice is ceftriaxone. So, piperacillin dazobactam, I don't think if you have ceftriaxone in hand, why should you go for piperacillin dazobactam? So, I, Dr. Arvind would be in a better place to uh, comment on it, but salmonella as in India is susceptible to cotrimoxol, is susceptible to chloramphenicol. We don't have an MDR salmonella and neither do we have a ESBL problem. So, ceftriaxone is good enough for salmonella. No point in looking for piperacillin dazobactam. However, it will work. I, I won't say it doesn't work, but ceftriaxone is a better choice. You can give totally one daily. So why do you want to give three or four times daily president as well? Uh, so next one is actually a, a conceptual question. Can you explain MIC and breakpoint concept? Oh my <laughs> that, that's a so the, we don't give um, we rarely give MICs. And we when we give MICs, we never give break 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 breakpoints because it will confuse the clinician, confuse us also, and everybody gets confused what to do. Breakpoint is a concentration of the drug that can be achieved that particular site. Okay, the concentration, like phosphomycin is excreted large amounts in urine, the breakpoint is very high in urine. And MIC is the concentration of the drug that will inhibit the bacteria in in vitro condition. So that is the minimum amount of drug that is required to inhibit. If your breakpoint, that is concentration that can be achieved is 32 and your MIC is 2, that means it is a very good drug to use. If your breakpoint is 2 and your MIC is 2, that means it is not a very good drug because it's always on the borderline. You may not achieve the concentration to kill it. That is what happened to piperacillin dazobactam when the MIC is 16 and you were treating an ESBL. It was not good enough to achieve that concentration with the normal doses. So we had an SDD, that is you hike up the dose so that you achieve that concentration and you kill the bacteria, though it is not it's sensitive. So hope you understood what the breakpoint and what the MIC is. We'll never give you breakpoints in our reports because it will confuse you and us a lot, but you can ask all the microbiologists, ask him and he will give you an information. Uh, sir, actually the questions are keeping on coming. I think uh, we'll take one question and I will go on to the quiz section, uh, session. Uh, in streptococcus pharyngitis, uh, should you do a throat swab or sputum culture? See, we have a group A streptococcal antigen test, a very robust, very good test. If you think group A streptococcus is there, do a throat swab and do the antigen test and rule out. The, our pediatricians do it. The moment we get a group A strep positive, they think it's viral, no need for antibiotic, and they get away with that. So group A strep, if available, is good. Otherwise, go for a culture. That is a very good method of doing it. But make sure that the throat swab is taken properly. It doesn't get contaminated with your oral flora. You don't, don't touch the tongue or any other place during the collection of the swab. That will contaminate the whole thing, and your cultures will come out faulty. And I will uh, so end with one comment by Dr. Neto from Kotem. So your talk was full of ID pearls. Each uh, of his line was sort of a, uh, a gold mine of 
microbiology as well as clinical microbiological wisdom. So I think that majority of our students would love to uh, have access to your slides or something like that. I think this lecture will be put on the, the yeah, sure. site. It's free for all. I didn't discover anything. Everything has been compiled. So everybody can have it, share it. It's good to have clinicians being interested because it will restore our burden and improve our reputation also for not giving everything or reporting unnecessary things. So it will be diagnostic stewardship will be taken care of. Pre clinical aspect would be taken care of. Pre analytic part will be taken care of. I'll be happy to share everything. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture, sir. And for those questions that we have not taken up, I think you can. Uh, uh, directly message sir he is you know very uh, will be very happy to answer all your yeah, queries happy, happy to answer if i know it if i know it i am a microbiologist remember so i may not <laughs> know the clinical aspect of id but microbiological aspect i am sure to answer thank you thank you very much sir uh, so um, with this we will go to the next session that is the, uh, the id quiz So I hope that you know, all of you are very familiar with the, the housekeeping rules, how to answer this question. So those who are doing a DM in ID or as a fellowship in ID uh, should not be uh, participating in this. And uh, there will be three questions and you should answer all the three questions together as a single answer. Don't uh, write the, uh, post the answer of the first question, then second, not like that. So, uh, go through all the three questions and answer all of them, all three of them together. So this is uh, a 28-year-old sexually uh, promised to this question number one. A 28-year-old sexually promised this little man presented with fever, fatigability, and rash of two weeks duration. On examination, patient is having uh, non pleuritic maculopapular eruptions on the trunk, the palms, and sores. His HIV, ELISA, and VDRL were negative, but TPHA was positive. In view of uh, discordance between uh, VDRL and TPHA, microbiologists discussed the case with the clinician and performed VDRL in uh, further dilutions and cleans the diagnosis. So what is the diagnosis and the implicated phenomena? So this is question number one, please write the diagnosis as well as the, the implicated phenomenon. So we have selected the, the three questions uh, where, you know, uh, we thought you know, <laughs> discussion uh, with the microbiologist and the clinician would have been very difficult to come at the diagnosis. So basically, in this question, you are supposed to write the diagnosis and the implicated phenomenon. We'll go to question number two. A 48-year-old gentleman presented with fever, myalgia, headache, and transient maculopapular rash over trunk. On day five from symptom onset, he developed generalized seizures, alteration of sensorium, and asymmetric flaccid quadriparesis. A clinical diagnosis of an encephalitic syndrome with anterior horn cell involvement was made. What is the optimal investigation to be sought? Is it CSF West Nile PCR? Is it CSF JE PCR? Is it uh, CSF or uh, serum West Nile IgM? Or CSF or serum JE IgM? I'll read the question once more. A 48 year old gentleman presenting with a clinical diagnosis of an encephalitic syndrome with rash and anterior horn cell involvement. What is the optimal investigation to be sought? So we'll go to question number three. A 26 year old pregnant lady at 14 weeks of gestation presented with fever, headache, maculopapular rash, arthralgia, non purulent conjunctivitis, and limb edema. So, limb edema, you can see. The lower limb as well as upper limb, there is limb pedium. So dengue NS1, dengue and chicken gunia PCR done during the first week were negative. Dengue IgM, which was done on day 8 of symptom onset, was positive. So what is the probable diagnosis?
Okay, now I'll type all the three answers together. Uh, Dr. Neha, doc, Dr. Nidin, are you there? I hope all of you have finished answering the questions. I'm there, sir, actually. I'm taking the screen. Sure, sure. Thank you. I think uh, all of you have answered, right? So, Neha, I think uh, I can go ahead with the answers, right? Majority have answered. Yes, sir. They have most of them have answered. We'll show the. Okay. Yes. Sure, sure. So I'll we go have to the few, answers. I mean, almost ten, fifteen. Okay. So the, the question number one, we know that, you know, the following COVID and all, there is a sharp increase in uh, sexually transmitted infections, the gonorrhea, the syphilis, etc. So this is a, uh, the di clinical diagnosis is secondary syphilis, and we know that it's proson phenomena. So proson phenomena means that in a situation where there is an antibody excess, because of this excess antibody, antibody antigen uh, lat uh, lattice won't occur. So the, this flocculation won't occur, and you will get a false negative a VDRL test. Ideally, we should not be ordering this VDRL and uh, this or the RPR and the TPHA together, but sometimes the, the clinician orders both of them together, like in this case. And that is why what uh, means, you know, prompted the microbiologist to uh, you know, discuss with the, the clinician. So if there is a strong clinical suspicion of uh, uh, syphilis, and we know that the proson phenomenon, the, you know, the incidence is around, say, 0.83% in syphilis, and uh, this will be higher in case of the neurosyphilis as well as in pregnancy where the incidence will be up to around say three percentage. So if you're having a very uh, strong suspicion of secondary syphilis, we need to discuss with the microbiologist because usually they will be uh, doing uh, this VDRL or this RPR in undiluted serum. So if your clinical suspicion is very high, they will perform in uh, you know serial dilutions and probably this will be able to overcome this proson phenomenon. So in case of the, the antigen excess that is refers to as a post-son phenomenon, and this uh, proson phenomenon is not exclusive to the syphilis alone. In brucellosis also, if you are uh, using the tube agglutination test and you are having a very strong clinical suspicion of brucellosis, you need to uh, discuss with the microbiologist and uh, ask them to consider the possibility of a proson phenomenon. Now, uh, going to the question number two. So I think my slides are not moving. Yes, number two. Uh, Question number two, an acute, uh, acute encephalitic syndrome uh, with an anterior horn cell involvement. There's a flaccid uh, uh, paresis with the presence of a maculopapillary rush. We should always think about the possibility of a vesinal encephalitis. In JE, we'll be having more of this extra perimeter symptoms. Here, the most important thing is when we, you know, when we are having a clinical diagnosis of a probable vesinal, it's a flaccid quarter paresis is there, a rash is there in a 48-year-old. Now, the question is, what is the ideal a sample to be sent. So if you are going for a vesinal PCR or for that matter, a JE PCR, for both these infections, usually the viremia is transient and occurs only during the prodromal period. So when the patient is presenting with this encephalitis or this quadri paresis, usually the PCR is likely to be negative. So ideal investigation will be asking for a CSF or a serum vesinal or a JE IGM. In this case, the clinical diagnosis, because usually the JE won't present with this flaccid quadri paresis and all. So the clinical diagnosis is, is actually vesinal. Patient is on day five of illness. So we should be going for CSF or, or you can do both or serum uh, vesinal IGF. So the PCR may, may be negative during this phase of illness. So the, the, the take home message in this case is that usually in vesinal as well as JE, the viremia usually occurs in the prodromal phase and it is transient and it will be a low level viremia. So after day three and all, going to get a, uh, the chance of getting a positive PCR is, uh, is very less likely. So, and we should be relying on the CSF and serum vesinal IgM. So why we should be relying on both is that 
Now we know that the neuroinvasive West Nile occurs only in one out of 100 cases of the West Nile infection. So you are having a CS of IgM positivity means that it's likely to be a neuroinvasive West Nile infection. And this is actually the next case is a, is a bit tricky. So we know that now in majority of the areas, you are having a close circulation of dengue of all the flaviviruses, dengue, chikungunya, as well as Zika. And uh, almost all the symptoms you now they share. And non purulent conjunctivitis, we know that is more commonly seen in Zika virus infection. So one point which might help us to differentiate between a dengue, Zika, and chikungunya is actually the presence of the lymphedema. So you can uh, go by this chart the lymphedema. So the lower limb edema may be uh, present during the, the polycirrhositis, the capillary leakage phase of dengue as well. But you're having an upper limb edema in the periarticular region without that much of arthritis, probably the patient is having a Zika infection. So the diagnostic clues is likely to be this in this patient. You, uh, you can see that the PCR done during the first week, there is a bioremic phase. This is done for dengue as well as chikungunya. Both were negative. So, so the chance of the patient having a Dengue or a chikungunya infection is less likely. Why the dengue IgM ELISA is positive? This is the problem because you now the, these are fly viruses and there are likely to be the cross reactivity. So in this case, you know, the PCR is negative, IgM is positive, NS1 is negative, IgM is later positive. Uh, think about the possibility of a Zika virus infection. So this chart actually helps us in differentiating between, you know, dengue, chikungunya and Zika. Uh, but then never, uh, never experience, you know, almost all the features are shared by all these viruses uh, with probably the exception of this, uh, the limb edema, the upper limb edema and the non purulent conjunctivitis and the, the, with the help of the microbiologist, probably we can tie Zika in these cases. And if NS1 is negative, IgM is positive and this sort of presentation, think about the Zika virus infection. And uh, this is probably the, uh, this, uh, this is not probably, this is the last uh, ID masterclass before the, the CISCON. So the CISCON is uh, going to be conducted in uh, uh, Chennai from 6 to 9 July. It's going to be an academic feast. So we have been interacting with you for the last one year on the online platform only. Probably, uh, you know, I uh, would love to meet some of you during the CISCON. So hope that all of you can make it to the CISCON. Dr. Neha uh, means no. Uh, how many of you, uh, do you have the list of the persons who gave the right answers? Uh, yes, Akhil K has given right answer. Arvind VL has given right answer. Uh, so they are supposed to type their email ID, right? Yes. So these people are supposed to type their email IDs and contact numbers, which we will uh, uh, collect and send them the, you know, so, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mrs., uh, sorry, Ms. Ruth will uh, further coordinate with them. Sure, sure. Akhil and uh, congratulations, Akhil and Aravind, and for all of them who attended, attended this uh, excellent lecture by Anil Kumar, sir. And please do type in your uh, email IDs. Yeah, I'll repeat it. Akhil K and Mr. Um, Dr. Ar Aravind VL. We request you to type your, uh, uh, you know, email ID and phone number contacts so that we can, you know, further uh, proceed with the gifts, prizes. So, Vidya Madam, uh, Sandur Nambi, sir, are you there? Uh, Vidya Madam, Nambi sir. I, and they, I don't think they are. Uh, they, yeah, are sure. yeah. they are not there, I guess, sir. I think. Okay, okay. So, so uh, on behalf of the Asset Speedy uh, Subcommittee, I like, we'd like to thank Al Kumar sir for this excellent lecture and for all of you who have attended this class. Hope to meet you all during CISCON next month. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for an amazing lecture. And it was really, it's, it was really a very informative session for even IDPGs. I think they would have loved to have such uh, more sessions. And uh, thanks a lot from behalf of all of us. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir.